This is a drug overdose call. Every 19 minutes in the United States, someone dies of an accidental overdose. This is crazy. Not a single solitary one of these people has to die. We're used to thinking of it starting here, looking like this. But something happened in this country. And now increasingly, it starts here, in your own home. He went to sleep and he had no idea this was gonna be his last night on earth. From misusing perfectly legal prescription drugs, taking a deadly dose. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Deborah. I'm a little concerned that I may have taken something that wasn't good for me on accident. I took a few methadone from my grandpa. Okay. And, and they were 10 milligrams. What you're listening to are actual calls. How is he acting? At the Washington Poison Center in Seattle. Just drowsy, okay. And lately, more and more of them sound something like this. And today I took about 90 milligrams of Percocet. Oh, you did? At 6 o'clock, I wasn't really thinking, and I did a bar of Xanax. And I'm reading all this stuff online about how that's a very lethal combination. But I have a lot of friends who died in their sleep, and I just wasn't really thinking. Yeah. So now I'm wondering if I should stay up tonight. That kind of call to me is really scary. Oh, it is scary. What, what goes through your mind? So I'd be very frightened about that young man not making it through the night. Dr. Bill Hurley is the medical director of the Poison Center. He's also a trauma doctor. Possibly too many of his meds. They're not sure what all they've got. We are here in Seattle in part because the problem is bad. This bottle still has quite a bit in it. But also because, as you will see, there are real solutions. No other meds. For Hurley, it started five years ago. He's got pinpoint pupils. He started noticing overdoses, a lot of them, coming through his ER doors. We thought, well, these are the guys who are on the street, maybe using heroin. But looking deeper, he realized they weren't junkies, not at all. It usually began with a back sprain. They were taking these medications not to get high, but to try to control pain, in most cases, back pain. And then they were mixing them with other medications and having fatal reactions to that. I mean, a lot of people have back pain. A lot of people take pain medications for that pain. And what you're saying is a lot of those people are then dying. Yeah, a lot of them are dying, and a lot of people in our culture right now are at risk of dying from the exact same thing. Car crashes are no longer the number one reason people die accidentally in the United States. Nowadays, it's actually prescription drugs. That's because on any given day, people take more than the recommended dose. Mix and match, or take medications not prescribed to them. Maybe take pills with alcohol. And all of it can make for a deadly dose. In fact, the most recent data shows 37,000 drug overdose deaths in one year, mostly accidental. About 21,000 involve prescription drugs. And of those, 75% we're painkillers. This could be you, it could be me. And that's the point. It could be anyone. On December 19th, 2011, Benjamin Gupta, a law and MBA student at George Washington University, died suddenly, mysteriously. He's no relationship to me, but when his family got word, they spent hours trading phone calls. They were in stunned disbelief. There was a message from his mom, and she had left three messages for me, so I knew there was something wrong. And I called her back, and I said, what happened? And she says, it's Ben. He died. It just, I, I didn't have any information. I finally said, well, how did this happen? And she said he went to sleep the night before and he just never woke up. He's always smiling, you know, in every picture yeah. he's smiling. You know. For days, Ben Gupta's family was desperate for answers. What killed him? He was only 28 years old. He had recently been given a clean bill of health. How could he just not wake up? 
And then the thoughts went through my mind that maybe it was some sort of a brain aneurysm or something must have happened. But his father was in for a shock after a conversation with the doctor who performed Ben's autopsy. And he called me, he says, yes, you know, they found oxycodone in his system. He tells you he believes that your son died of a, an overdose of narcotics. Yeah, right. Did you think it was possible? What you knew of your son? No, no. And he worked for the State Department, and he, you know, was going to graduate in a year with a dual law and MBA degree. You know, the type of person where it just doesn't even run through your head that, that he's having a problem because he does so well. Stuart Bridge was a close friend of Ben's. They met in grammar school. Ben told Stuart that he and his new girlfriend had tried oxycodone, and they thought it was no big deal. It's not something I'm seeking out, but it's something that I've tried. Now, anyone else might just shrug off that conversation. But Bridge wasn't just a friend. He's also a doctor. And he warned Ben about taking oxycodone and about mixing it with alcohol. I've, I've seen people die who are on these medications or who have, you know, experimented with these medications. The line between experimentation and death, it turns out, is tenuous. Oxycodone and other painkillers like it are what's called central nervous system, or CNS, depressants. They slow down the body's vital functions, breathing, heart rate, blood pressure. That's not usually a problem when the pills are prescribed for you. But when you add them to other CNS depressants, like alcohol or other prescription drugs, the effect is multiplied. The nervous system slows and slows until breathing, heart rate, brain function, all grind to a halt. Ben's deadly dose, according to his girlfriend, was drinking beer and scotch throughout the day, along with an unknown quantity of oxycodone. Ben fell asleep in front of the TV, and by the next morning, he had stopped breathing. It's almost what makes it even more frightening, that he went to sleep and he had no idea this was gonna be his last night on Earth. I mean, he had no idea that this was gonna be it. You explained what happened to my friend to me in two sentences. Good to see you, sir. How are you? I first learned about Ben Gupta's story when I got a phone call just after his death from former President Bill Clinton. Ben's father, Vinod, is an old friend of the Clintons. What kind of kid was he? A light shined out of him. That's all I can tell you. He grew up, he was big, strong, handsome, smart, and wanted to make something of his life. He was industrious, but he was normal. He liked to have a good time. He had, I promise you that night, he had no idea that he was turning out the lights. None. And if it's true of him, it's got to be true of a lot of other people. Vinod finds some solace from his son's death by funding programs that educate people about the dangers of misusing prescription drugs. And recently, he made a $1 million pledge to the Clinton Global Initiative to support the former president's newfound passion about this issue. He said, I have been very fortunate, and my son was worth a million dollars. It's still hard to talk about. Well, it is. It is. Do you think it ever won't be? No, I, uh, I think about him all the time. Like, I'm in D.C. today, so I went walking on the GW campus. Looking for it. You're looking for it? Yes. And I could feel it. I could feel it. Every day, I just think about it. Every day. We've seen absolute skyrocketing of overdose deaths, and it correlates directly with the number of prescriptions that are written. Quetiapine, so it looks like he downed the 200s. In cities across the country, this scene plays out every day. I saw it myself on a ride along with Lieutenant John Fisk of the Seattle Fire Department. Person had three dilaudid, two methadone. This patient's deadly dose an anti-seizure medication, and a couple of powerful painkillers. He may have stockpiled some of his own and taken it afterwards. It's called stacking. Prescription pills stacked on top of other pills. 
each one amplifying the previous one's effect. I'd say it probably began about 10 years ago. Or Dr. Steven Anderson, an ER doctor in Washington State, sees the end result of stacking virtually every time he goes to work. I've taken two Vicodin before, no problem. I've taken a Valium to sleep before, no problem. I've had a couple of drinks before, no problem. But all of a sudden, you add all of those into the same scenario, and it adds up and causes the complications. You're talking about when you say stacking, it sounds like making it exponentially worse. Exactly. Here's why. Pop a pain pill and you get pain relief. And at the same time, your breathing slows down. Now, even after the pain relief wears off, that slowed breathing persists, sometimes for hours. Now, if you pop another pain pill before it's time, you depress the breathing even more. Some of the deadliest combinations, high-dose painkillers stacked on other painkillers. Painkillers stacked with anti-anxiety medications or painkillers mixed with alcohol. We've seen absolute skyrocketing of overdose deaths and it correlates directly with the number of prescriptions that are written. The problem in part is that here in the United States, we are being flooded with painkillers. Consider this, Americans take 80% of the world's painkillers, 80%. Distribution of morphine, which is the main ingredient in most popular painkillers, increased by 600% between 1997 and 2007. Pain couldn't have increased that much in 10 years, but painkillers did. It's become a lucrative business, and with so many pills out there, there's no broad system in place for doctors and pharmacies to keep track of it all. And again, every 19 minutes, we see the consequence. And that doesn't even account for people like this man, who came close, too close to dying. Thankfully, he survived. And overdose is not the only side effect associated with powerful painkillers. When did you start taking opiates? Dr. Jane Ballantyne is an anesthesiologist at the University of Washington. So we have very good physical therapists. That 10 years ago, while treating patients on high doses of painkillers, she found something surprising. Not only were those patients not getting pain relief, but the painkillers were in fact doing something that could best be described as the opposite, making patients more sensitive to pain. It's called hyperalgesia. Hyperalgesia was so obvious in those patients that you could, for example, see that they couldn't bear the sheet on them or any intravenous stick was abnormally painful to them. You said that the this has essentially been 20 years of a failed experiment. I would never suggest that we shouldn't continue to prescribe for those that are really helped by opiates, people who have a real need. But the way we do it at the moment is actually harming more patients than it helps. Okay. Former President Bill Clinton's familiarity with painkillers goes back to when he lived in the White House. Have you ever been prescribed a medication like this? Well, I did take some painkillers when I tore my 90% of my quadricep. But I tried to be very careful, and I was in a lot of pain. And years after leaving the Oval Office, he would once again need pain pills. He says he and his doctors were cautious. After my heart surgery, you know, and I was, I hurt pretty bad for three weeks. So I got some medicine, but I really tried to get off of it as quick as I could. And my doctors were really good about it, you know, telling me, you know, take this if it's killing you, but be careful. Poison Center, this is Rosie. Be careful. It's a warning that might prevent call after call pouring in here at the Washington Poison Center. Poison Center, this is Deborah. Uh, I wasn't getting pain relief. I took too many oxycodone. I took um, um, five, ten milligram oxycodone. And I'm feeling really shaky, lightheaded. I'm just nervous. So how did we quietly become a country inundated with pain pills? Some believe it all began when pain was designated the fifth vital sign. I think physicians around the year 2000 started to get pushed to better manage pain. And 
the physicians in our culture, that means give out more medication. So pain becomes a vital sign. Laws are passed liberalizing the use of opioids for more than just cancer or chronic pain patients. That creates new marketing opportunities for aggressive pharmaceutical companies. Doctors prescribe the drugs for legitimate reasons, but also for conditions that could be treated with much milder medications or with therapy. The result? We prescribe enough pain pills to give every man, woman, and child a dose every four hours for three weeks. Remember, 80% of the world's opioids are used by Americans. 80%. Does that surprise you? Know that. No, because... Is that a cultural yes, problem? It is cultural. You know, people think, oh, I've got a headache, or I've got this, or my elbow sore, or whatever. And look, I don't want to minimize. There are a lot of people who live courageous lives in constant pain. But there's no question that since we represent 5% of the world's people, we got no business popping as many pills as we do. Problem is, misuse is rampant. In 2010, about 12 million Americans reported using painkillers without a prescription or medical need. And that number, every 19 minutes, someone died. The challenge, of course, is finding ways to stop misuse, addiction, and death without cutting off a lifeline. Life starts to lose some of its meaning when you're in chronic pain. I have seen her curled up in a fetal position for hours. You're taking more than, than we now consider a safe dose. Washington State has been one of the places hit hardest by the prescription drug overdose epidemic. I think this is the worst man-made epidemic uh, in history. Dr. Gary Franklin is medical director for the state of Washington's Department of Labor and Industries. When is the first time this even became an issue that you, that you had noticed? By 2001, our claims managers were sending me cases of injured workers who had had uh, a low back sprain and who were dead three years later from an unintentional overdose of prescribed opioids. It was the saddest thing I'd ever seen. So he took action, helping write guidelines that this year became state law. It applies to non-cancer chronic pain patients. It mandates prescriber education, treatment plans called pain contracts between physicians and patients, and tracking of opioid use. If states don't do new laws reflecting best practices and universal precautions, so opioids can be used much more safely and effectively, this will never turn around. The Washington state law does have its share of critics, many of whom are patients dealing with pain right now. I have seen her curled up in a fetal position for hours, even crying at times. In Tacoma, Washington, Christy and Bert Goler, husband and wife, are both in pain. His caused by multiple sclerosis. My leg is constantly being electrocuted from the inside out. Hers caused by a car accident. 16 years ago. I was in a big old 77 uh, Chevrolet station wagon, bent it in half, and I looked in my rearview mirror and I, I could actually see the woman putting mascara on and I knew I was in trouble. She's putting I, on mascara. Yes, yep, that I could see. And uh, she just plowed right into me. Unfortunately, uh, to this day, still have uh, back issues because of it. Are you in pain right now? I am. Yeah, um, the pain medications make a huge difference, thank goodness. Without them, I, I don't think I would be able to, to work a full-time job. But she says after the new state law passed, no doctor would treat her. How hard has it been to find doctors who give you the medications you want? Since this law passed, uh, it's been incredibly difficult. I ended up calling multiple clinics. I would call and they say, First words out of their mouth, if you want pain medications, forget about it, we're done. Christy believes doctors are turning away patients because they see prescribing any pain medication as a risk. A lot of them didn't even look at them and were not inclined to uh, prescribe me the medications I was on. I just didn't think I could handle one more doctor's visit and being, feeling like I'm being attacked and being treated as a liar. But doctors here say the guidelines, first published in 2007 as voluntary, are reversing the overdose epidemic in their state. 
Between 2008 and uh, 2010, we saw about a 20% decline in the state in the number of deaths. Possible solutions for Washington state. But what about the rest of the country? Do you think that it's fixable? Sure. We like our pain pills in this country. It is fixable. I think now just bringing this out will have a lot of corrective impact. You're the chief of explaining things. What do you tell the American people about this? I would say, we're going to start a national conversation about this. But you need to have one in your family. You need to have one in your place of worship. You need to have one in your place of work. You need to make sure your kids talk about it in school. We need to understand that it is a good thing to alleviate pain. It is a bad thing to kill people through abuse of those alleviations. In a nation overflowing with so many pills, with so many patients wanting and expecting the quick fix, with so many truly naive prescribers, users, and misusers of medications, we have to find a way to prevent people from taking a deadly dose.